Hi, everyone. Welcome to the DataDev Mini Challenges How to Webinar. We are really excited to have you on board today. We have really excited DataDev, excited as well, to show the solution to you. Uh, first, some logistics. If you have any questions during the webinars, feel free to use the Q&A box on the right side of WebEx. You can ask questions and also share your feedback. I'm Geraldine Zanli, aka Gigi, and I'm a developer advocate at Tableau. So let's do a quick check. Can you hear me all? If you are here, can hear me, can use the Q&A box or the chat just to confirm that you can hear me? Yes, okay, perfect, thank you. Just taking, you know, WebEx. So first of all, we am going to introduce you what are the DataDev site mini challenges. You might not be aware of them and you might want to know more about them before we get started and show the solutions. Then we are going to go over the solution. Level one is going to be presented by Soha, level two by Elliot, and level three by the team, Brian, John, David, and Jason. So what are the mini challenges? But first of all, I just want to spend one minute to congratulate every participant. We got so many submissions from all around the world, from different level, different backgrounds. Some people, it was the first time they actually did some JavaScript and did some coding or use extension API. So thank you all for participating and congratulations again. Really excited and I was really overwhelmed by all the submission we got so far. So what are the data dev side challenges? It's three months of fun challenges. 18 challenges in total, and we have three different levels, easy, moderate, and advanced. If you start with the API, you can maybe do easy, then move to moderate and finish advanced. Maybe not the first week, maybe the first set of challenges, but who knows, maybe in a month, because it's three months in total. First month you do level easy, second month you do moderate, third month you do advanced, no? That works. We have different categories, extensibility, automation, integration, and embedding. So the first set of challenges was on extensibility. Today, our challenges are on automation integrations, and in two weeks, it's going to be on embedding. So you can find out and discover new challenges as well, but you, or even new APIs that you maybe didn't use before. How does it work? Every two weeks, we publish a new set of challenges. So it means you have two weeks to solve the challenges. The first week, you have an API focused webinars. Kisha Rose, another developer advocate in the team, did a workshop on extension API. Was it last week already? Was it last week? Yeah, I feel like it was last week. On extension, or maybe two weeks ago, if I remind it right. But next week, we are doing another workshops on webhooks and REST API. So you can get started with this API and solve the challenges and learn new skills. After two weeks, we are going to host webinar like the one we are on, where data dev people from the community are going to show how they solve the challenges. What did they do? What could they did, etc. Of course, you're going to learn a lot of new skills, you are going to get an expert in extensions or expert in the REST API, for example. That's already a reason why you should take these challenges. But another reason is prices. Of course, we all love swags. So level one, if you solve and you validate, you submit on time, you get a data dev sticker pack. Level two, you win an exclusive data dev water bottles and level three, you are winning a 2020 data dev t-shirts and beanie. That's not cool. How to win? 
First thing, you need to be part of a developer program. If you are on this, web, on this webinar, that means you're already part of a developer program. But if you want to talk to your friends, your colleagues, and they want to participate on the data dev challenges, you, ask, you might ask them first to join the developer program. Then they need to validate, or you need to validate the challenges. All the challenges have different roles and different ways to validate the submissions. So you can check on our website how to validate and your submission. We're talking about the website. If you have to remember anything from my introduction, is this URL. is where you're going to find out all the roles, all the instructions to get started with the challenges. We also have a Slack channel, a uh, Slack workspace, only for data dev, and we created a Slack channel just for you to ask questions and get answers from people from the community or even from the developer, the developer team, the engineering team, so you can ask questions. And for the first time this week, we introduced for level four, three, we introduced for level three, you can actually teams, uh, team up to solve the level three. Up to four people, you can start and work on the challenge with your team. So why not meet new people on Slack and get started together? You can have different skills and different backgrounds and work together. It's also a great way to network with other data dev. So now, solutions. Last week, last two weeks, we had three challenges for three levels on extensibility. Level one is going to be presented by Soha. So let's just look at the challenges. They had to complete one of these data dev mini challenges to be able to complete level one. So I'm going to give you the WebEx stage just for you. Thank you, Gigi. Um, so I'll share my screen now. Hi, so I'm Soha and I did level one. Um, starting points, I'm quite new to JavaScript. So right now what I'm doing a lot of is um, the Udemy course, looking into JavaScript, and then I'm looking at projects and completing them, which is a good way to practice what you've learned if you're like me and you come from no coding background at all. Um, I found out about the whole mini challenges thing from Andre from the information lab. Um, and then that's how I started getting into it. So I'm going to start walking through my code. One thing that I thought was a good thing to mention that I did struggle with was the debug mode. And that was because my Google Chrome was the latest version. So thanks to the Slack channel that Gigi mentioned earlier, where a lot of people were encountering this problem. So it was easy to figure out why that was happening due to people answering questions on the Slack, which was the solution was downloading the Chromium browser. And it looks like this, yeah? And this is really important for you to see which parts of your code that are working or aren't working. So, yeah. In Glitch, that's where, that's the platform we've used to write the code and build the extension, which here, as you can see, this is the end result where I built two buttons that lets you filter between last month and last year. So one of the most important thing as well to remember is that when you're building an extension and you wanna test it in the debug mode, you need to use the command prompt to open your Tableau dashboard. Um, just like this, as you can see here. And then this will automatically open Tableau for you. And then all you have to do is just open up your extension. And that part, you do that by downloading your T-Rex file, which you've got here. And then you go in Tableau and you just import your extension and then just specify what file it is from. And then you can see here, you've got the extension in Tableau desktop. So 
going through the code, what's important as well is that you've got your the parts that you edit the most is your HTML file and the JavaScript file. And in your HTML file, here it reads your JavaScript, which is this part. And also this part is the body. And in this part of my HTML code, that's where I specified my buttons. So this part, I just inputted the text that you wanna see in your user interface of your extension. So for me, that's what I wrote. And you can see here, it matches. And then you create your button IDs. So I wanted two buttons, one for last month and one for last year. So in quotation marks, that's your ID. And you need to remember how you've written that out because that's what you're gonna reference in your JavaScript file. And then in between the crocodile brackets, you write the text of how you want it to look like in the UI side of things. And if you're new to this, like me, a really good site that I found that talks about buttons is the We Three Schools. And they've got a whole section about buttons and how it works. So I definitely would recommend you guys looking at that. So then you come to the JavaScript and that's where you write most of your code. So you just start off by initializing extension. And then here you just reference your sheet name. You make sure that your sheet name is written in the exact same way that you've got it written in Tableau. Here you declare what your field names are. And then the console.log, this is, this is the part that you get to check in your debugger if your code is executing correctly or not. So when I open Chromium and then I just click my extension here under console, I can see, okay, hello from Tableau, just like here, console.log, hello from Tableau, this, ex this part executed correctly. If it didn't, that's where I'd see my errors. So if, for example, my extension isn't working on Tableau desktop, there isn't anything to tell you why it isn't working here. So that's where you use the debugger to then see here, okay, where are my errors showing up? Why isn't it working? And then figure that out. So initially, I approached writing it in the way that it's listed in the instructions in the GitHub page for the mini challenges, where I just declare what my fields are going to be, what I want to filter, and what worksheet I want to fill, what worksheets I want this filter to be applied to. But then I wanted to create my buttons in the user interface. So in this part, I'm just declaring what my variable is, which is going to be my last month button get element by ID, this part is reference, it's going back to the HTML. So that's where, that's why it looks exactly the same way as it's written out in the HTML code. And then here I'm saying, okay, like when someone clicks on this and that's what add event list is saying. And then here in the console.log, I'm just testing out that someone clicked on this. It's like when someone clicked on this, then go to the field name called date. Also, I want to declare today as well. And then this is my last month calc. So here I'm just saying, okay, for my last month calc, I want you to go from today minus one, so get the previous month. And then this part, I'm just selecting that date range between last month and today. So it's apply range filter. And you'll find out like what functions you need to use um, based on the documentation that's in Tableau Help, which is really helpful. And then here I'm just saying, okay, the minimum is last month and then the maximum is today. And for last year, it's just the same. And then here in console.log, I'm just checking again that my clicker is working. And I'm just saying go to field name date. And then here it's just the, the last year calc. I'm just saying, okay, like from today, minus one, I want last year, I want minimum to be my last year day and maximum to be today. So that's 
all I've done. And then here, that's where I've tested my extension. And last month, you can see in the date range here, it's working. And last year, that's it on my end. So unless anyone has any questions, um, I can check. Thank you. So if you have any questions, use the Q&A box on the right side of your screen, and we are going to take questions at the end. Okay, cool. So I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you. So next, we have level two, of course. Makes sense. And we have Elliot that is going to show a solution for the mini challenges. You had to create an extension that allows you to search all fields in a worksheet. You enter text and you select any item in your viz that match that text. For example, if you are using Superstore US, you search for tables and will match tables in the subcategory, but also tables, conference table in the product name. And yet the stage is going to be yours in one minute. Just a quick background on Elliot. I actually found out about him via his blog. He has a very cool blog with a lot of blog posts on automation, REST API, metadata API. So if you are doing level the new challenges, you might also want to check his blog. I'm going to unmute you, Elliot. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can we can see your screen as well. Oh, I lost audio from you. Yeah, all good. Okay. All right, everybody. So um, this is how I st set the stage for uh, solving this level two of the challenge. I just put together a really basic worksheet um, pulling in uh, from the Superstore data set, which anybody can build from. We have uh, subcategories and products. And uh, anytime we enter text into this um, input box here, what the process is going to do is it's going to look inside your subcategory values and look inside your product name values. And if any of the text that you put in here um, matches these, uh, well, any string, any um, portion of the text in that product name, then you're going to get a match and it's going to display down here. So for example, if we start typing in table and then press enter or click on this button, uh, what's going to be returned to us is this rendered in HTML, the, um, the kind of a header for which column uh, the value is coming from and then the actual values that matched. And we can see that it's not case sensitive. So lowercase table is matching up with tables. It's matching up with a lot of stuff down here. And then uh, a little going the extra mile thing that I wanted to do was if there's no match for one of the fields, then that section um, of HTML disappears entirely. So as we type this, um, if we find, let's say, you know, accessories, that gets a match for subcategories again, that section of HTML comes back, but then as, uh, as you don't have matches for that, it disappears again. So with that, having shown you that, let's uh, dive into how this thing's working in the background. Um, so hop over to Glitch. And um, just a heads up, the, the way that I did this was, um, was using a JavaScript framework. Uh, so I used Vue just because I want to learn that anyways. I hear it's pretty good to combine uh, Vue with D3, another JavaScript library for data visualization. And so I'm uh, I'm still pretty new in the JavaScript territory. So that's kind of the approach I took. Um, I, I was just, I followed a couple of videos from uh, this Udemy class on Vue, and that gave me everything I needed to know after just a, a couple of videos to, to make everything you see here work. So I highly recommend that, um, checking that out. So the way this works, um, first of all, that we can ignore this. This is from that level one challenge. But down here, uh, we'll notice that 
everything that I write in my JavaScript is contained inside this, um, this view object, this view variable. And what this is doing when you're using this framework, um, it's basically outsourcing a lot of the, the lower level work that you would need to do, interacting with the, the DOM, which is like usually how you would say, um, hey, I want to find a certain element in my HTML and I want to modify it. Uh, instead of having to do that all manually with uh, vanilla JavaScript, the view framework is going to allow me to say, well, I'm, I'm creating a view object and I'm going to look for an element that has this ID. And we know it's an ID because in HTML, you know, even if you're familiar with a little bit of CSS and whatnot, the, uh, the pound symbol just indicates um, that it's an ID, whereas a dot would indicate that it's a class. If that makes no sense to you, don't worry about it. If you start watching this guy's class, all that stuff gets explained as well. But uh, if I go to my HTML, we're going to see that there is a div that uh, that's basically just a coding section. This div has the ID app. So everything that I'm defining in my JavaScript for that view um, that's looking for the element with the ID app, all of that's going to get applied to whatever is inside this, uh, this div element with that ID. So let's walk through that. Um, well, maybe the HTML first. We can see that I have a, a few different sections of HTML here. Uh, this button was for my level one challenge. Uh, this button relates to the level two challenge. So we can see that I've given this a class of section and everything in here has uh, everything that I decided was its own kind of section, its own sovereign territory of my HTML code. I gave this class section uh, for the reason that that just gets called out in my uh, styling sheet as giving a margin of 10 pixels. So if we look out here at my Tableau uh, extension, you can see that these buttons aren't flush up against each other. They have 10 pixels of space between them. So that's really all that that bit is doing. It's, um, it's saying any of these elements in my HTML that have the class section will get a 10 pixel buffer or margin between them. So taking a closer look at this button, um, the where view starts to come into play is here with this little at click symbol. So if, if you're using vanilla JavaScript, you're going to be doing this in a in a different way. It's probably it might take you, um, let's say, like, you know, seven lines of code to process, whereas I'm using view. So this step takes me two lines. Uh, you know, that's a trade off you get with a framework. You have less direct control over all of the individual elements. Um, but what you get in turn is uh, is a kind of expedited process of getting things done. So I don't really have to do much heavy lifting here. The view framework is doing it for me. And what this is saying is um, at click, like when I click on this element, when I click on this button, we're going to trigger whatever I've defined as search fields in my uh, JavaScript. So let's hop back into the JavaScript and see what is search fields. Well, search fields is a method that I've defined inside my view object here. So it has the element that I'm going to be modifying. It has data, which is basically where I define variables. And then another thing you can define inside your view object is methods. One of those methods is search fields. So uh, when I click that button, I'm triggering search fields, and that's going to kick off that process of saying, all right, what are the columns in your visual? Uh, what are the values uh, within those columns? Let's loop through each and find the value. If it matches this input text, we're going to display it for you. So walking through uh, that process in the JavaScript, we, when we trigger that search fields uh, function, what it's going to do is it's going to define a couple uh, local variables uh, right up front. And this uh, this little statement here, let VM equals this, that's just because uh, something that happens as you as you build functions within functions, as I do down here, like we can see here, I define a function, then within that function, like basically I'm in my dashboard, then I want to say, okay, for, uh, for my worksheet, I want to get my data table, then for each column in my data table, I'm going to do something. We're kind of having this nested 
uh, array of functions. And so we might lose track uh, on from a coding perspective. The well, we don't lose track, but the the as the program's executing, it's going to lose track of what the scope is. So if I try to reference a variable from out here, uh, like my product search, that's the this is a value that's representing what I inputted into that that little input text area. Um, this this value needs to have some kind of pointer to it. And so that's why I define this VM equals this outside in the scope. Uh, this is kind of marrying that scope to um, to this variable. So we'll see that come into play down here as I reference VM dot subcat values. That's just saying that I'm referencing this subcat values uh, VM dot prod search. I'm referencing this prod search up here. So anyhow, uh, as for the actual logic of moving through this, try not to get too deep into the weeds and just keep it high level. Um, we already kind of discussed it, but let's run through this one more time. Uh, this is basically saying in my dashboard, I have a worksheet, right? So for each worksheet, I'm going to get the summary data. Well, in the case of my Tableau workbook, I just have really uh, one sheet I care about here. And so let's see how that gets handled in my code. Um, I, I get that table. That table has certain columns in it. And I'm saying here, uh, I define two different blocks of code. This is actually, if I'd had more time uh, or if I were smarter, I would have broken this out to where instead of repeating the same code, I build a function and then say, you know, for each dimension that I find in my data, I'm going to loop through it. And that would basically say, well, you have a dimension named subcategory and you have a dimension named product. Let's loop over those. But I just kind of took the barbaric, um, a barbarian approach here and brute forced it saying, well, I know these two columns exist. So let's loop through those. So for each of these columns, um, I'm building a little empty array called value list. And then as I travel through every row in that uh, column, I'm going to be testing, hey, does, uh, does the value within that row, um, if I convert it into lowercase, does it include, so do my product names or do my subcategory values include this uh, vm dot prod search value, its lowercase version, and um, prod search. Like, how does this even land here in JavaScript for me? Well, that's all part of the magic of view, because we define our variable prod search here, and then looking back into our HTML, uh, another useful thing that uh, view allows us to do is these bindings or um, or creating a model. In this case, this does a binding for us while. Uh, while marrying that to this prod search value that I can reference in my JavaScript. The result there is as I'm editing this, whoops. Uh, let's go back into that sheet. Technical difficulties. So as I type different values in here, um, it's just changing uh, because that, that prod search value is married to the value I have in this input text. It's constantly changing what that uh, prod search variable is storing inside of it. So um, that's how we get to the, or that covers the input section and how JavaScript knows um, how to match the values we're typing in against the values in our worksheet. And then uh, finally, just to kind of bring this to a close, um, these sections here are what are rendering the data for us. So um, we have this other handy component of view called a vif. And what this is basically going to do is evaluate whatever JavaScript is here in the quotes. So subcat values out here in JavaScript, I'm just um, I'm creating a subcat values array. And any time that I, I find a match in the uh, in this case, in my subcategory that matches what I have in my input text, it's going to just end up populating this array with those subcat values. So um, any of those values get stored in that array. And then out here, um, view ends up saying, all right, if the length of that array is greater than zero, then we are going to show everything inside this template. And again, all this template stuff and all this view, I knew nothing about this before starting this challenge. And everything I learned, I learned from this master over here, Maximilian. So uh, so you could do this too. So basically these templates will either show, if I have this VF here, it's going to show that information or it's going to hide it. 
So that gives us this effect here where, um, you know, table. Now I'm showing this template that shows my subcategories. I type in Netgear. Now that array is not greater than zero, the length of it. So I don't end up seeing that template. So that's what the V if does. Um, you also have this useful V4 method. So um, if I do have my any subcategory subcategory values, what this V4 is doing is I don't have to type out, you know, a hundred different list elements. The V4 iterates over, it's basically a for each from JavaScript or a for loop, you know, from Python, from any language. It, it just looks for an iterable, in this case, my array subcat values. And it says for each value in that array, so for each subcategory in my subcat values, we're just going to render. Uh, that's what these two little curly braces wrapped around this variable do. They they say grab that JavaScript variable and put it in um, put it in play here. Where in this case, this is the the value that will be rendered. So I get a new list element for each one of those values, and um, that process is repeated down here for my product names. And that uh, with danger of talking too long here. That's how we solve that level two challenge. I was muted. Perfect. Thank you very much, Elliot, for the presentations. Now we are going to go to level three and to the to Brian. Sorry. Brian, your mission was right back to data source. We ask you the community to build a right back extension to any data sources or any file. Did you accept the mission, Brian? I did. Thanks, Gigi. <laughs> Let me share my screen here. All right. Do you see my screen okay, Gigi? Yes, perfect. All right. So um, just want to introduce myself really quickly. Brian Wise, I'm the Chief Data Officer at Halo Site. We had a team of four that worked on this, uh, Jason, John, and David. And uh, we're a little bit new to Tableau, and we wanted to try and build something that we could possibly use in our product. Uh, so really quick background about our product. Uh, Halo Site is an augmented analytics tool that analyzes unstructured data inside of Salesforce and tries to get insight out of that unstructured data and make it available to uh, business intelligence tools like Einstein Analytics or Tableau. And so just a quick example, say you store an email in your Salesforce data, we extract that email out, we read that email, look for things like sentiment, look for things like entities, products that are mentioned in the email, kind of like the search that Elliot just did, but we're doing that across all of your unstructured data that's sitting inside of your Salesforce instance, and then making that useful as a data set to something like Tableau or Einstein Analytics. Well, one of the things that we wanted to do was allow our user to give us some feedback on our AI processes directly in the visualization. And so for this case, what we did is we said, all right, we do this entity extraction. We look for names of products, use neural nets to look for names of products inside of your unstructured data. We present that list of products back to the end user. We want them to be able to give feedback on that and say, no, I don't want you to ever look for that product again. That's not a good product. Or yeah, we like that product and that's good. And so that was the goal of our visualization, something that we could add to our product here at, at Halo Site. And real quick architecture on how we Put this together. Um, so for this visualization, we are using the Postgres connector to do live queries against a Postgres database. Uh, and then we built a quick little Node.js app that it would allow us to mark an entity uh, to what we call blacklist the entity, which means we want to leave that entity out of all future analytics that we do. Um, and we don't want to look for that entity anymore. So we have two web services that we can call, one to blacklist an entity, one to unblacklist the entity. Um, and so we wrote our extension that invokes that those web services, whichever web service is appropriate. That web service updates the data in the database, and then we refresh the chart. So that's enough PowerPoint. Let's go out and take a quick look at it. Um, this is a good example of what our data looks like after it goes through our pipeline. So if you remember, we got all these emails, live chat transcripts, text fields that are stored inside of Salesforce. We read all of those 
and we look for product mentions and we've got all kinds of smarts that goes into exactly how we find those product mentions. But here's the list of products that might come back from that. We do other things like sentiment analysis, and trending and things like that. But for this demo, we'll focus on the product mentions. And let's say Google, you decide now that's too generic. I wanna take that out. That's what our um, challenge was supposed to do. So just to show the challenge really quickly, this is a different set of entities here um, coming from that Postgres database. And if we don't like phone, we can just click right on phone and it will call that web service. Try that again, click right on phone, should call the web service and not sure why we're not getting that in there. Refresh this really quickly. Might be my Heroku web service waking up in the background. There we go. So that invoked the web service. You can see we've got our tiny little uh, extension here. Um, it invokes the web service, changes the data, and then refreshes the screen. Now this entity is blacklisted. If we want to unblacklist it, we can just click it again. That will unblacklist it, update the database in the background, refresh the visualization. Um, so taking a quick look at the code here that makes that happen. Um, so if we go into our extension, you can see the index.html file is just a simple initialize to tell us that, hey, the extension is ready to go on the dashboard. And then all of our logic is here inside of this server.js file. And so one of the things that we're looking for is an on change event. So, or a mark selection change. So that's the Tableau API that we're using there. Whenever they change a, a mark um, on the dashboard, we wanna run this function called edit. And so this edit function is gonna go through and find the ID of the entity that you selected. So we selected the phone and we grab its ID. Um, and then we figure out whether or not it's currently blacklisted. And so we're looking at the data here, trying to figure out whether or not that's currently blacklisted. And that helps us decide which web service to call. And so you can see we're starting to construct our web service call out here. Um, so we can do, um, that's kind of our base URL there. And then we either add blacklist or unblacklist um, to the URL. Um, and then we put our URL and put a request ID on there. That request ID is what we got from the item that was selected, the ID of the item that was selected. And then we do a simple put request to this web service and send that over. So that calls the web service, which updates the database. Um, and then we tell Tableau, go ahead and resync the data or refresh the database. And so that's querying the database live out of there. And so if we go back just really quick so you can kind of see what's happening here, here's a direct connection to my database. Let me run this query, see what the state of everything is. So you can see nothing is currently blacklisted. We go back in here and click on the phone. We see that refresh there. We can also go back in the database itself and see that the phone is now blacklisted. Um, so that's in there. And then one last thing that I think I'll share here is um, our actual Node.js application. You can see we've got a couple of endpoints here. We've got an entities endpoint. You can get a list of all entities um, and then you can blacklist and you pass an ID and you can see there's a put request here. And when you get a put request to blacklist, uh, then it runs this code right up here, which is really simple code. It's just doing a single database statement update that entity database set the blacklist equal to true. Um, and so that's what kind of pulled everything all together. Uh, one resource that we used uh, just a great uh, blog entry here on creating and deploying a Node.js REST API, because um, in order for this right back to work, we had to have that REST API. Uh, so we were writing the extension, also writing the REST API so that we could update our database. Um, and that's kind of how we got our level three visualization put together. Thank you. So now we are going to take some questions. But first of all, I have a question for you. Who is going to do next week's challenge? I want to see some answer in the chat. Who is going to 
take and solve and excite who is excited to take this challenges this week challenges they are on automation and integration much answer so now let's take some questions do you have any questions for our three presenters people excited so I have a question is you all or you free you showed how you got started with Node.js or everything was Vue.js but how what how did you learn the Tableau part how did you learn about extension API what are the different um, different videos or tutorials or training that you use to learn more about extension api i think i'm going to go to soa first if you can unmute yourself and tell us more how you got started um yeah so i got started by looking at the content that's available that you guys put available on your website in the mini challenges and the webinar that you had what was it like two weeks ago and alongside that i've also been doing a udemy course in um javascript and um so i work for the information lab so i've got people like andre who's there who's built a lot of extensions so he was a really good person to ask so i guess i would recommend people if you know someone who's built an extension before like reach out to them ask them questions it gives you a lot of guidance and also i just googled a lot to be honest so there's a lot of blogs out there as well about extensions in tableau and other like things that other people have done on the developer side of things so reading a lot of blogs about some of the content that people put out there and just googling i google like crazy every time i have a question and then if I don't have an answer, then I try to find someone who does have the answer and then I ask them. Yeah, I think Google, when you get started with any APIs or any new language is like the best place to find an answer. 100%. Google is my best friend right now. <laughs> figuring this out. And if you don't know anyone that's worked with extension, you can also join our Slack channel. Like we are on it, we monitor it, we try to answer. I went on like a couple of calls with some people from the developed from the challenges just to get them started as well on one on one. So feel free to use the Slack, Slack channel and we are happy to take some questions on the Slack channel as well. So um, now I think before we uh, we have a question as well. Of, um, let's just continue now. Elliot, can you tell us a little bit more about your journey with extension and how you got started? Yeah, sure. Uh, so for extensions, this was the first exposure that I had ever had to extensions. So everything that I learned about this process happened inside uh, that two weeks. But as for the Tableau ecosystem, I've been working in that extensively for the past five years. Uh, I work for a company called Innerworks, and we do um, a lot of Tableau consulting work. Um, one of the oldest Tableau partners out in the wild. So uh, yeah, I had a, a lot of experience with just Tableau itself coming into it. Um, but pretty new to JavaScript done a little bit here and there, but in terms of, uh, of this kind of thing, yeah, this was, um, this was new to me. And Brian, how you got started with extension API, which tools, which trainings material did you use to learn more about it? Yeah. Um, like Elliot, I'm brand new to the extensions. And so my first extension was started with the github samples that uh, you provided as part of the challenge uh, and then one thing that we also used was a um a recording uh that i think you posted on the slack channel gg on how to do a write back extension and so we made a lot of use of that recording uh can you remind me who did that he shares he 
Keisha Rose. Yeah. So we watched Keisha, Keisha's um, presentation and then been making good use of the documentation. And as was already said, Google is your friend when you're learning a new technology. So <laughs> that's true. So, Brian, I have a question for you as well. As I understood with extension, it is possible to change value in PostgreSQL database table. Is it possible to connect with other databases like Teradata? So, as, um, as long as you can do it via a web service. So, the question is, can you change data in other data sources like Teradata? Um, as long as you can connect to that via a web service, then you can make that change via the extension. So we did a little Postgres database here. Uh, what we really want to do and, and are, are working on now and looking at is actually going back and updating some data in their Salesforce instance. Um, and so we did the Postgres because it was Postgres because it was simple and we can stand up a test environment. But you know, Salesforce has great, you got to make an authentication call and actually authenticate in, and then you'd make a REST call to update that data. And then, um, then you call that. So as long as your data source, you can do an update in your data source using a web service, then you can make that change. I think if you're interested as well, I see a few questions on write back extensions and how to write back to data source. We are going to post the link of a recording. It was a live, uh, live coding with Keisha, Keisha Rose on extension and how to do write back. So we are going to post the link of the recording and invited, I invite you to go and check the recording and you're going to learn a lot from our extension queen, Keisha Rose. And let's see. So Brian is Brian. Oh, Brian, I is the upcoming put request the web service being authenticated by the database prior to the updating the table? Yeah, that's a great question. There's actually two points of authentication that needs to happen. You might put some authentication around your web service. We didn't do that with ours. So our web service is out there open to the public and the extension just calls the web service and didn't have to authenticate. Second part of the authentication is the web service that Node.js app needs to authenticate um, to the Postgres database. And that's actually done in a properties file inside the Node.js app. You actually, you specify where is my database, um, what's the username, the password, if you want to use SSL. Um, and so that's all just done in a properties file of the Node.js app. All right, thank you. So another question for you, Brian. What is the use of Node.js? Trying to understand the functionality of Node.js in your demo. Yeah. Um, so Node.js here, um, the when you're working with an extension, you're working inside of a JavaScript framework, and you can make web services calls easily from that JavaScript framework. Postgres doesn't have any native web services that you could call. So I needed some way to update that Postgres database. Um, I didn't want to make a direct database connection from inside a JavaScript. Not even sure if that's possible. So the Node.js is kind of an intermediary that's hosting my web service for me. Um, and uh, so the extension is JavaScript, calling a web service hosted by Node.js, and then Node.js is what's actually talking to the database. Um, also good to put a layer of security isolation there between uh, your visualization, your backend database. Perfect. Thank you. Let's see if you have any questions, uh, use the Q&A box and I'm taking, I'm reading the question as we talk. Now that you have done the, the challenges, do you see yourself building an extension for your real dashboards? So I think that question is for everyone and let's go one by one. Maybe so if you can start first. So the question is, do you see yourself building an extension for a real for your real dashboard now that you used it? Um, yeah, definitely. I see potential and how it can be used um, in real life in the business use case scenario. Um, but I think it's also about handover. So, for example, if 
I'm a consultant, so at the information app, so I wouldn't really that wouldn't really be my first thing that I would do just because usually I would have to hand over my work to someone else. And if that someone else doesn't have any JavaScript experience, then that would actually create more work for them in being able to figure out what's happening and maintaining it versus using a normal field. So I think first I would only jump to creating an extension in that kind of scenario if that was my only solution towards the problem I'm facing. But if the problem I'm facing can be solved in Tableau itself, I would go with that. But that's mostly because of my role and the kind of environment and the fact that it would be about handover and making sure that handovers are smooth as possible. Versus if I was handing over to someone who knows JavaScript, I mean, that wouldn't be a problem at all. Makes sense. Elliot? Yeah, I think I'm in the same camp as SOA there, um, especially being in the consulting space as well. You, you can see how, um, how difficult it is sometimes for people to maintain even just uh, vanilla Tableau workbooks that have some tricky level of detail calculations or something. So I see a lot of potential there from uh, from the standpoint of what you can do, and uh, I think that's why I'm so interested in learning the D3JS and the view side of things, because if you can build um, some visuals that you just can't do with vanilla Tableau, then that just expands the, the tool set for those situations where a client is just looking to make the best visual possible, and they aren't as concerned with the technical uh, burden that it might place on them for maintainability. Ryan? Yeah, we're absolutely uh, looking at building some extensions into our product. We, uh, we currently sell Einstein Analytics um, kind of pre-built dashboards for our product and plan on uh, also providing Tableau dashboards. And so like this uh, entity blacklisting is a good example. Uh, what Elliot showed uh, with the search um, will actually be really useful as well because um, we've got a lot of long text fields and and the ability to, okay, how was that entity actually used in the text that somebody wrote, you know, in the body of an email or something like that. Um, and then one of the things we're most excited back to uh, do a little uh, foreshadowing of the next challenge is the ability to dynamically create and deploy a hyperfile. And so that's the, the challenge that we're working on for this next section. I think that was the bonus in level two for this Thanks. next week. So I don't see any questions, but um, I have a question for you. So for anyone on the call, what is your advice for them if they want to get started with the challenges or get started with our APIs, Tableau APIs? Let's try, let's start by uh, Brian again. Um, you know, the, the many challenges I mentioned, the GitHub, um, you know, looking at other people's code is just a great way. And so from the mini challenge site and where the challenges are set up, um, you can get access to some great sample code. And uh, so this next section, I'm pretty weak in Python in this next week that's coming up. And I was looking at people's Python code and was able to get through the level one of uh, this challenge in about 20 minutes just by looking at other people's code and figuring out um, what's being done and how to use that Tableau server client library that's available for Python. And so um, just reviewing other people's code and very thankful for people who publish it out on GitHub and make it easy to accessible, easy to access. Thank you for sharing. Now, Elliot. Yeah, I think um, especially for the, the next set of challenges, the ones coming up with the, uh, the REST API and the metadata API, uh, something I encourage doing is if you have a uh, if you have that Tableau online dev site, um, probably the easiest thing you can start doing is playing around with querying that metadata. If you if you go to um, the the graph, like it's it's graph IQL. Um, I forget the exact endpoint, but maybe we can share that. But uh, but but if you Google also, um, or if you're on your Tableau online site and you're um, I think there's a section where you can click on querying metadata. But if you Google, um, you know, graph, graph EQL, uh, Tableau, 
Um, I'm sure that you'll find a way to get there, but it, but it lands you at a really user-friendly interface where you can write these simple GraphQL queries um, that can be as easy as, hey, what are my workbooks and what databases feed into those workbooks? Um, and it's a really great way to start playing with the data um, that these next set of challenges kind of expose you to. Um, and then other than that, with the REST API, I, that one's also like really well documented and just practice like downloading data sources or querying your projects, um, you know, seeing what users are on your site, all that kind of stuff is, is really valuable to know how to do. Okay, thank you. I posted the URL is metadata slash graphql. So I posted it in the chat if you're interested in using the metadata API. Now, Soa. I agree a lot with what Brian said earlier. So I'm doing a challenge and I got through level one just by looking at the Tableau help document. Here you've got a lot of example codes about that list how to sign in using Python and how to sign out and reiterating again based on what Brian is saying. GitHub, there's a lot of useful code out there um, with the Tableau REST API. I'd also look into in general how to, if you're new to Python, like me, how to connect um, to an API using Python in general. I think it helps a lot more as well to understand the code and the structure of the code if you do that background reading and understand how to connect to an API on a basic level before you jump onto something like the Tableau REST API, which is a lot more complicated due to the authentication process. Perfect. Thank you. So that's it You're for welcome. today. Thank you to all the presenters and explaining the solution. We are going to share the recording on YouTube. And if you're interested in the mini challenges, go to this URL and you can see the different levels and the instructions how to solve it and give some tips and hints how to get started, especially for level two. Thank you all for coming and thank you again for all the presenters. So, See you next time. Bye-bye.